Okay, good afternoon everybody and thank you so much for being here both in person and online. Today's lecture recital will be on Leon Kirchner's Five Pieces for Piano. These were written in 1987 and they are based on his earlier song cycle called The Twilight Stood for Soprano and Piano and those were based on poems by Emily Dickinson. This sharing session is a snapshot of my process as I explore the music by comparing the two scores of the solo piano version and the song cycle. So I've actually been like low-key obsessed with Kirshner's five pieces for a really long time. I first um, stumbled across the scores here in the YST library um, when I was a student here, like more than 10 years ago. And I eventually got the score for myself and learned it. I've not programmed it in public yet, but I've played it at a couple of auditions. And I actually did not know about the song cycle until last year when I was bored during the COVID lockdowns and I bought the score. So I think one way to help you to get acquainted with this music and also to see where I'm coming from as a performer would be simply to play through this piece and let you hear it for yourself. So I'm going to play Kirshner's Five Pieces for Piano and then I will talk more about my explorations of the song cycle and the solo piano score.
Okay, sorry, thanks for that. Okay, so that was Jan Kirchner's five pieces for piano. Even, even if you didn't know that that originated from a song cycle, you can hear that this music is very rhetorical and gestural in terms of the rhythms and the melodic contour that guide our year to these shorter musical groups and units. So even before I encountered the song cycle, I wanted to explore in my playing how to phrase through groups of notes. How do these musical units respond to each other like speech? Kirchner's um, commercially available score does not make any reference to the piano piece's former life as a song cycle, um, which was completed five years earlier. In reworking the song cycle for solo piano, Kirchner kept all of the solo piano part with just a couple of small changes. However, the vocal line received very different treatment. In many cases, the vocal line was omitted altogether. In some places, the piano part already contained traces of the vocal line in cue notes or in echoing the rhythms or doubling the pitches of the vocal line in the piano part. However, um, sometimes the vocal line would be added in and worked into the new solo piano version. But this would not be apparent to a pianist who only gets to know the music from the solo piano version. So I am interested in exploring the performance decisions that arise in comparing the piano material with the song cycle, particularly with regards to the implication of the text setting and its absence in the solo piano pieces. As I compare the two scores, I allow my response to the song cycle to challenge, confirm, and enrich the response that I've already had to the solo piano version. The methods that I built uh, for the Kirchner come from some of the methods that I developed in my doctoral work on transcriptions and the music of Charles Griffiths. So in my doctoral project, I was comparing Griffiths' solo piano works with his later orchestral versions examining in particular the relationship between the performer's concept of instrumental color and notions of structure. So this project builds on the tools that I developed for that previous project, but now for a different composer and using the element of words rather than orchestral color. I'm interested in exploring and articulating how a performer perceives, negotiates, and evaluates information in a score and how those values and knowledge might interact with practical performance decisions. I found Daphne Leong's research and her approach to this topic of how performance and analysis might interact and intersect extremely helpful. In particular, I'd like to highlight this quote about how she used the term structure in her book, Performing Knowledge, which I took as the starting point in my own exploration. So Daphne Leong writes, it is the sense in which structure is created in the process of making music by composers, performers, listeners, and analysts. Structure in this broader conception explicitly includes perceived, performed, and even imagined elements. It can be active, fluid, and dynamic. So in the case of my exploration of the Kirshner pieces, my concept of this piece is grounded in my physical experience of playing the piece as a performer and involves the performer's imaginative evaluation of elements which may not be fully tangible in one single score. In my process of gleaning, comparing and evaluating information from the two scores, I organize my responses into four categories. The first two categories on the left have to deal with um, smaller scale local implications regarding word painting and themes and also inflection. The third and fourth categories have to do with larger scale implications, marking out sections and gestures and navigating the different roles in the music, namely text and piano ref response. Before I dive into the details of the music itself, I want to make it clear that this exploration is not about discovering the composer's voice or trying to be true to the composer's original intentions, but uh, rather it is my attempt as a performer to enrich my response to the music by expanding the scope of artistic potentialities and ways of making meaning that are available to me. To that end, I chose to ground my exploration primarily on my response as a, as a performer to Kirchner's scores 
and not on Kirshner's playing or his words. I have not had the opportunity to meet or work with Kirshner himself, but he was a wonderfully accomplished pianist and he has performed and recorded both the song cycle and the solo piano version. The recordings are available on YouTube and Spotify. It's interesting to note that he plays both versions differently. However, I wanted to avoid merely copying or imitating Kirshner's performance decisions or treating his playing as the definitive interpretation of the score. I wanted to articulate a response to the music informed by my own pianistic sensibilities, shaped by my exploration of the two scores and my evaluation of the various elements that I perceive, perform, and imagine. So now I'm going to show a few examples of how I worked through my comparisons of the song cycle and the solo piano version. The first example has to do with the category of inflection, and this is from the very first piece of the, of the set. So one of the first things that stood out to me when I was comparing the scores was when groups of notes corresponded to specific words or syllables. So in bar 13 of the first piece, we have the word crucifix and wilderness in bar 19. In both cases, the vocal line, along with the accents and slurs, were omitted, cut out from the solo piano version. Although there is some trace of the inflection for wilderness in the previous bar, bar 18. Before I saw the score for the song cycle, I would play through the notes and throw away the end of the groups, um, leading forward as part of a longer, larger gesture. However, the articulation markings, corresponding syllables, and the importance of the word as the last noun at the end of the line made me slow down the overall pacing of the gestures. I experimented with giving more weight to the last two semiquavers of crucifix. I also tried to continue the articulation of bar 18 into bar 19 for the word wilderness, which helps to slow down, put some breaks on the falling line. I'll show you an example of that um, in about two slides from now. <laughs> Another implication I found re regarding specific words is how Kirshner used word painting for the word hammer in bar 15 and 16. I noted how bar 15 itself was a larger, more aggressive version of the opening intervallic pattern of falling semitones. The huge jumps in the left hand, it imitates the physical gesture and imagined impact of swinging a hammer down. And that really inspired me the next time I practiced that section and the kind of colors that I was looking for. Knowing that bar 15 and 16 corresponded with the idea of hammer helped me to identify other hammer gestures in bars 22 and 24 over there and also in bar 28. I would certainly go for a clanging, striking timbre for bar 28, but as I'll discuss later, I would choose not to do that for bars 22 to 24. But before we go on, let me show you a clip of my experimentation with inflection and word painting in this section, bars, 20, bars 10 to 20 of the auctioneer. Another category of response I came up with when looking at the song cycle was noticing how Kirshner's text setting helped me to recognize and mark out certain sections in the music. Kirshner's setting splits the poems between the fifth and sixth line. When the subject shifts from the auctioneer to the prices of despair. In bars 20 to, in bars 20 to 33, right after the word wilderness, we have a section that disrupts the flow of the poem. It contains fragments of text in the wrong order. The piano part also contains fragmented gestures. So I call this section of fragments the wilderness section because the flow of the music and the poem has been disrupted. 
when we emerge from this wilderness section, the setting of line six of the poem when it resumes in bar 35 is acknowledged by a falling semitone motif and a minor third, which echoes the opening motif of the very first bar. Within this wilderness section itself, we have the text declaiming going, 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 gone. I've marked out each instance of that with the red arrows. The final hammer blow on gone in bar 28, the very last one there, it seems to be the climax of the whole first piece. That utterance of going, each one of them, takes place within a separate crescendo gesture that builds to that moment. Everything that takes place after the word gone de-escalates de in terms of dynamics, rhythmic intensity, and tempo. This had a lot of implications for me in terms of pacing my dynamics and timing to climb steadily towards the gone moment in bar 28. In particular, it's very tempting to overplay the hammer gesture in bar 24 on that first line there because of how low the gesture is in the left hand on that low C. But recognizing this as part of a larger progression, going, 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 gone, that helped me to keep that in check. Another detail about inflection comes at the very end of the piece, where the paired quaver rhythms in the piano part echo two syllable groups in the text, particularly the words single, human, and to two. This contrasts with the setting of not anymore in that last bit there, set with an augmentation of the opening motif with even crotchet lengths. This inspired me to play that last motif there, very spaced out, stretched out, to highlight how evenly spaced these three notes are compared to the two note rhythmic groups that came just before it. So let's listen to a clip where I try out, try out these ideas from bar 20 right to the end. So that's, that's the first piece. For the second piece, we have an example where the vocal line is directly added into the piano part. So for me, this had two implications. Firstly, inflection, thinking about how I might shape the notes that correspond with the words. For example, the very first line, he scanned it. So the second F is less than the first, scanned it. Secondly, in terms of roles, in recognizing what comes afterwards as a response to the words. So here's a clip from the opening where I tried it out. There are also many imaginative possibilities that open up with word painting in the second piece. The poem vividly describes a man in mental distress as he contemplates ending his life. In bars 27 to the end, there are potent words like God, caressed, grope, and trigger. So in my playing, I explore the shock factor of the leap of registers on the word God as well as the paradox of having a relatively benign mezzo forte dynamic 
on the word trigger, but having a huge plunge in the bass. I also experimented with how I could physically caress the keys to draw out those three notes at bar 34 that correspond with the word caress. I also explore how the imagery of a man groping blindly relates to the tempo indication of playing haltingly. I'll show you some of that in the next clip. For me in the second piece, the most interesting aspect of the text setting is how between the two stanzas in bar 22 to 27, there is a section of delirious vocalizing, as if illustrating the protagonist's troubled state of mind. This is also a rare instance where the solo piano version is different from the piano part of the song cycle, in that the solo piano version is more intricate rhythmically, though the outlines of the notes are the same. So when I experimented with this delirious vocalizing section, I wanted to find a tone color for this section that would indicate a detachment from reality, something a bit more distant. So let's listen to a section of this clip of the second piece from around bar 13 to the end when I'm thinking about word painting and also this section of delirious vocalizing. Okay, so that's the second piece. I'm going to skip the third piece for now and maybe come back to it later if you have time. I'm also going to skip talking about the final piece altogether. Few reasons for skipping the final piece. Um, the vocal part of the final piece is completely independent from the piano part. They rarely align rhythmically or melodically. And in Kirshner's solo piano version, he just cuts out the vocal line altogether. Both parts are extremely virtuosic. It's the climax of the entire set and there's not a lot of relationship between the two parts for the final piece. So let's talk about the fourth piece. In the fourth piece, what's really interesting about this is that the entire vocal line is actually embedded, hidden in the solo piano version. Some notes were deliberately added in, while some were already in the piano part of the song cycle. What I was interested to explore is the different roles of the sung text versus the piano response. So I've marked out in red the parts that belong to the original vocal line with numbers for each uh, line of the poem. The highlighted yellow bits are the piano response with the darker yellow bits, though it might, not, might be, be a little bit hard to see on the screen. The darker yellow bits are characterized by the idea of falling major sevenths. It's interesting that this falling sevenths motif remains in a relatively similar register and dynamic range for this entire piece, as if it's not bothered and undisturbed by the madness and the outburst around it. 
recognizing the piano responses to the sung text also helps to shed light on the various sections in the third piece. We're not going to go through um, all of it, but you can see from what I've marked out that the solo piano interludes that punctuate the text are characterized by two ideas. The dotted um, figure highlighted in yellow and a sweeping gesture highlighted in red. We can see that the first line of the poem in bar six, so the second line there, is slightly separated from the second and third lines, which, which are set in bars eight and 10. I put the poem there with a break in between. So the piano interlude helps, to help, helps us to see Kirshner's interpretation of the poem, as if the singing of the crickets in the first line is the trigger for the actions of the sun setting and the workmen finishing their jobs in the second and third lines. The last line of the stanza is an observation of how these actions of the cricket, sun, and workmen sets a finishing seam upon the day. And in the setting, the music steps back, see in the second last line there, the music steps back by referencing the opening dotted motif before declaring the final line. The word seam, so the second red arrow there, the word seam is marked with a rippling arpeggiation, which visually and orally represents this juncture in the music. And there's also some really lovely word painting with the cricket song with the tremolo in bar six. The piano interlude again sets apart the first stanza from the second stanza at the bottom of the page. And this will pretty much be the case for the rest of the third piece the piano response punctuating the poem and helps us see the divisions in the text. I think the major underlying question with all of this is, to what extent should I be concerned with bringing out the implications of absent text? Because I'm performing this as a solo piano piece that stands on its own merit and not as a piece that is missing an essential part. So, for me, sometimes the rhythm, momentum, and color of the piano writing takes precedence over the implication of the text setting. So the, the example I put on the left there is the second stanza of the third piece. The way I group the piano gestures here actually goes against the line breaks of the text, but because of the rhythmic patterns and the contours of the piano part, I've decided to do that. In the example on the right is from the fourth piece, I feel that the accelerando in bars 13 to 16 takes precedence over trying to show the punctuation and the line breaks of, bar of the text in bar 14. So that, acceler uh, that accelerando in the piano writing is more important than the text in this case. There are other pieces besides these Kushner pieces that deal with the idea of hidden text. For example, we have Alban Burke's Lyric Suite, where the last movement is actually a vocal setting of a Baudelaire poem done as a secret message, but that was removed and hidden within the string parts. Um, a composer also told me about a jazz saxophone player, John Coltrane, his album, A Love Supreme. Also, the last track has a melody which is set to a poem that's written by Coltrane, but the poem is never sung but it's embedded within the melody. And that secret poem, he puts it in the album liner notes. Next weekend, I'm playing a piece um, with some musicians of the SSO that was originally commissioned by Take Five, um, and that's by Joyce Cole. So in that piece, she takes text from Samuel Beckett's play, Waiting for Godot, and embeds that into the instrumental writing. So the inflections of those excerpts of text um, affect the way the instrumental parts interact and also the way that they're supposed to phrase and inflect. But for me as a performer, what I'm interested in here is the idea of the imagined possibilities of transcription and how a transcription sheds light on the original and vice versa. The idea of transcription as a tool for the performer to sharpen and color a response to the music. So for me, the benefit of comparing these scores and analyzing my own response to it as a performer is that I've enriched and expanded the range of artistic possibilities available to me. I'm free to make different choices each time I come to these pieces, and you can hear that the recording is different from the way that I play it right now. Um, so I'm reacting to the elements of the scores each time, the way that I perceive, perform, and imagine these elements. 
and in that way, my reading of the music and its structural elements remains active, fluid, and dynamic. Thank you for listening, um, people in the room and also on the Zoom chat. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to type it in the comments or ask me um, personally. I'd be happy to answer them. I'll stick around for a while. Thank you.